Today we're going to talk about space chains, which is the most <laughs> modest of sidechain proposals. I wonder if my touch screen will make it switch slides. Will it? Yes, it will. Sweet. I can just touch the screen and make it go back and forth. Just do both. No, it doesn't. Okay. So uh, space chains were invented by Ruben Thompson, who's an internet friend of mine and a uh, genius cryptography wizard. Well, he's just kind of a Bitcoin inventor. He invents a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then I was the first person to implement the space chain, so I'm presenting this talk today because I actually made one. Yeah, I made, I made one of these things. Uh, so let's get into it and talk about what we're going to cover today. We're going to cover the two main parts of what constitutes a space chain, which are blind merge mining is one of them, and the other one is a one-way price peg. And so we're going to go over what those mean, and you're going to learn all about what space chains are. Then, we're going to talk about how to do blind merge mining. This is the real cool trick that Ruben invented that lets us do these things. Uh, we're going to talk about how to do that. We're going to discuss some use case, potential use cases for these things. Uh, and then we'll do a comparison of what we mean by a one-way price peg with other sidechain models that use two-way price pegs. Uh, and then I'm going to do a demo. And we're going, to, we're going to actually launch a space chain together. And in fact, I'm just going to go and show you guys uh, that part first, so that you can um, so you can follow along when we get to it. So I'm going to take this URL. This is the GitHub for the Space Chain Launcher, and this URL is where we're going to go to make a space chain together. And if anyone wants to get a preview of what this is going to be, we're going to launch a space chain on the test net. So I'm just going to pull up um, Bitly and pop this URL in there. And if anyone wants to uh, go to this URL, you can go straight there on your device and prepare to make a space chain, or even just start doing it on your own before we even get to it, because it's pretty self-explanatory, uh, but we're going to do it together. So feel free to go to this URL if you want to get started ahead of me uh, with making a space chain, uh, or if you want to wait until the rest of us do it all together, you can do that too, because permissionlessness is awesome. Um, so I'm going to hold this up here for just a minute while I try and remember what the next slide is. This is a bad decision. Uh, so let me see what the next slide is. It is... It is about merge mining. Okay, so merge mining, let's go into this. Let me know if anyone needs that URL. You need the URL? This was a bad decision. <laughs> Yeah, it's also on Replit, but I don't know how to go to Replit, so. Okay, uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, so if anyone wants to take a picture of that, then you can share it with other people so that you can all find this. Uh, this is where we're going to go at the end of the slide, of the, of the thing. Also, github.com slash supertestnet. You can go there and then search for Space Chain, and that will help you find it. Okay, we're all good? Everyone found what you need? Okay. So, back to our slideshow. Let's talk about merge mining. So merge mining was invented a long time ago, way back in like 2010, Satoshi, maybe even before then. Uh, the very first, from what I'm told, the very first fork of Bitcoin was a blockchain called Namecoin, uh, and they wanted to do DNS systems over, uh, over Bitcoin. But Satoshi was like, this could be bad, because if you guys have a bunch of miners who are mining blocks, and we have a bunch of miners who are mining blocks, we're like dividing up the work and we're making both blockchains less secure. So Satoshi came up with this idea called merge mining, by which both blockchains could use the same proof of work system. So blockchains, of course, they need to know the order of blocks in their system, otherwise you can do double spends and other horrible, horrifying things. So Satoshi's invention of merge mining allows Bitcoin blocks to contain two, um, information about two different blockchains, ours and someone else's. So ordinarily, in a block, you've got, let me show you one. Here's an example of a block. This is block number 784,800, uh, mined two weeks ago. And look at all those transactions that ran that block. Uh, it normally has uh, something called a Merkle root, which is, does this does mental space show you the Merkle root? No, they don't. So all of the transactions that are in this block, see there's like five pages of them, or maybe even more, it's like 2,000 transactions in this block. 
in every Bitcoin block, you take all of those transactions and you take a hash of them. The hashes are pretty small. They're only like a 32 byte value. And you put that like in the top of the block. You put it, you put it just in the top. It's called the block header. And uh, that little hash represents all of the transactions that are in that block. So every Bitcoin block has one of these hashes of all the transactions that are in it. There's a small little data piece of data. I'm representing that right here with just uh, you know, a, a small little piece of data that represents all the transactions that are in that block. But with merge mining, you put two of those in the block. You put a second one in, and the second one corresponds to uh, all the transactions in a second blockchain's block. It's like Bitcoin's got block, where is this? 784,800. You can have a side chain that's also on block 784,800, but all the transactions in that block, they're summed up in this little hash, and you just put that right into Bitcoin's block. And if you do that, then once the miner mines that Bitcoin block, all of the work he puts into it also is valid for this other blockchain. It's merged. It's like he did, one, he did work to validate two different blockchains or to uh, ensure that it's really hard to do double spend or reorgs of two separate blockchains. So that's pretty cool. You can actually secure two blockchains with the same amount of work. And you can do this as many times as you want. You can, miners can put as many of these hashes in as will fit in like four megabytes. But it gets really efficient. Uh, but there's a couple problems with regular merge mining. One is that you need special mining software to do it because the miners have to like take all of the transactions on this special side chain and then they've got to hash them. So like they've got to know about all that, all that stuff that's happening on this side chain. Uh, and that, re that requires them to run special mining software. Maybe not all miners are going to want to do that. And it also helps proliferate altcoins because miners aren't going to, well, they need to be paid somehow for the work they're doing for the second blockchain. And uh, typically that means you've got to create an altcoin uh, that you can pay them with for doing all this work. Like everyone who's putting transactions onto this side chain, they're going to be contributing fees. What are they contributing fees in? It's usually an altcoin. Like Namecoin was the first altcoin because they had to pay, the, pay, they had to pay Bitcoin miners to mine their transactions. So the problem with, problem with regular merge mining, it requires special mining software. This also makes it really hard to bootstrap. Like if I want to start a, um, a, a new blockchain or a new side chain, I've got to like convince miners to, to run this software so they can validate transactions happening on my side chain and then put the hash in Bitcoin. And it's just hard to get all of them to agree. Like Rootstock has been trying to run um, merge mining, has been trying to convince miners to run their merge mining software for like five years, and they're only at 50% so far. Uh, so it's just hard to bootstrap a regular merge mine blockchain. So Ruben, the great inventor, the wizard, came up with blind merge mining, which is a different little scenario where miners don't even have to know what's happening. Uh, they don't have to run any special software. They, don't, they still make money off of it, which is cool. And uh, it, it works really well. Some of its neat nifty properties are that it doesn't need a software, or uh, sorry, is that you can do it with a software. Uh, Mr. Bit300 right here wrote one of them. Bit300 lets us do this. I also invented line worth mining in 2017 January, but Ruben invented the idea of doing it in a different, completely really normal transaction, not different. I'm sorry. I, the reason I said um, Ruben invented blind merge mining is because I'm going to presenting how he does it, and not I'm not presenting how he does it. But this guy did. He is the, as far as I'm aware, he's the original blind merge mining. Yeah, you hyped it all up and making it great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what what what'd you say? I said I you hyped it all up and the great genius Ruben. Zahn. Yeah. I'm not sure, my guy. With, with, there's multiple geniuses. <laughs> yeah, this guy did it first. This guy did it first. Uh, but I will be presenting how Ruben does it, and, not, and I won't be presenting the 301, uh, which is another way to do this. And it does require the require Yeah. Uh, another way you can do blind merge mining to get all of these cool properties is with uh, SIGHASH no input or OPCTV or op vault. And then there's, there are ways to do it without a soft fork, uh, which is what I'm going to demonstrate, but it has some trade offs. Uh, so, Blind merge mining is like a better way to do merge mining. You get to inherit Bitcoin's proof of work, the difficulty of doing reorgs, you get to inherit the, you know, the, the consensus on the order of blocks, all of that stays with Bitcoin. Um, but how do you do it? Well, you either need a soft fork or you have to accept some trade-offs. You guys with me? All right, cool. 
Lubin was more or less saving my Bit 300 idea because it was so ignored for so long, and then he came up with this, and then he was like, Paul Storz, and then line work. Line yeah, work, and then it was like people talk about Bit 301 now because of because of Ruben. So before. Before I go into how we do blind merge mining, I want to talk about the other aspect of space chains. So back here I said there's two parts. There's blind merge mining and there's a one-way price tag. So we're going to do a little more about how to do blind merge mining, but first I want to tell you how a one one-way price tag works. This is one-way price pegs are, are stupid. They're the worst idea that Ruben Thompson ever came up with. And he didn't he didn't come up with this either. Uh, someone else came up with this. <laughs> I'm not going to blame this one on, I, I'm only going to attribute good things that Ruben didn't invent to Ruben. Bad things that Ruben didn't invent, they belong to someone else. So one-way price pegs are, the, are a concept of, uh, what if we destroy bitcoins? <laughs> that's, that's the basic idea. We're going to destroy bitcoins, and then we're going to like keep track of the ghosts of these destroyed bitcoins, and then trade those as if they were money. Uh, it's awful. Don't Never do this with real money. Um, but basically, Bitcoin has this function called opreturn. It's part of Bitcoin script. And if you use opreturn in a Bitcoin script, uh, you can destroy Bitcoin. You can send it to a, this output that just always basically just returns nothing. And then if someone tries to spend those coins, they can't. Uh, so you can use this to completely burn Bitcoins. And with the space chain, or at least with Ruben's idea for a space chain, this is what you do. You, you, you have you have your little side chain that you can come to order on the consensus on the you can come to consensus on the order of transactions, the order of blocks by using blind merge mining. Uh, and then how do you get money onto it? Destroy all bitcoins. Uh, destroy your bitcoins. You put a proof on the side chain of, of the of the destruction of bitcoins. And you say like I burned five bitcoins. So now I've got five dead bitcoins, and they're going to live. They're going li to have an afterlife on this side chain somewhere. Uh, and maybe we can use them for money. Maybe we can use them for paying fees. Uh, but the, hopefully, the idea of these things is that uh, they have a cap on their price. A dead Bitcoin can never be more, worth more than like a real Bitcoin you can still spend on Bitcoin. Because if they ever were, this situation would happen. You'd be like, hey, I have a space coin here. I, I burned a Bitcoin to get it. And I would like you to buy it for me for 1.2 Bitcoins. This guy's over like here, like, what do you think I am, an idiot? I can burn my own bitcoins. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but, but you can never have, you, the, their price can never increase beyond the value of the bitcoin because you can just make them yourself, uh, which is kind of neat. Awesome, you got a question? Isn't this what Stacks used to do? I don't know. They I called think it proof of burn. It was like an original protocol. Yeah, the counterparty was proof of burn. Okay. Counterparty definitely had a protocol where you burned bitcoins to get counterparty tokens. But I think Stacks did that to launch theirs as well. Yeah, yeah, that's like... Yeah, these idiots over at Stacks and the idiots over at Counterparty were the first ones to come up with this idea. Don't blame this part on Ruben. But Ruben somehow likes this, like this genius guy. Yeah, no, I don't get it. Whatever. I like it too. Okay, so that's, that's one way peg. And according to Ruben, a space chain is the combination of these two things. You've got blind merge mining and a one way peg. That's a space chain. Uh, I like the blind merge mining part, and I'll show you how we do that. I don't really like this part, but I implemented it anyway because man, he trapped me. When, when I was looking into space chains for the first time, I was like, burn bitcoins? Why would you even do that? That's ridiculous. This is the stupidest thing you can come up with. And I started being like, wait, how would you even do that? I don't even think it's possible. And I started thinking, oh wait, we do have op return, and you can't spend those, and you could make a proof that you did it. And then I was hooked. I was like, now I have to do it. Because <laughs> once I figured out that it was possible, I had to try it. So I, I've actually implemented this, but I, I don't think it's a good idea. Just not everything I implement is good. How much Bitcoin did you burn? None. I only did this on testnet. Okay. And what we're going to do today is on testnet. Okay, so that's one way to think. Uh, here's the cool part, though. Here's the part I actually like. It's how to do blind merge mining. Uh, there's no reason why a hash has to be created by a miner. Earlier in this slideshow, I showed you over here regular merge mining. The miners create this hash, this is the hash of all the transactions in Bitcoin. And miners also create this hash, this is the hash of all the transactions on the sidechain. Well, there's no reason this one has to be done by miners. Anyone can put data in Bitcoin. So what if we just had the people who are using the sidechain add the hash to Bitcoin? Like, that seems like a reasonable thing, because why, why make miners do it? They're, they might not even be interested. 
Um, but yeah, so the, the idea of blind merge mining originates from the fact that all we really need in order to uh, put data in Bitcoin is something like an op return, or more recently, as uh, the Ordinals project has shown us, we can even do this with witness data. You can just put, put random data into a Bitcoin transaction. And anyone can do this. I've got a couple of examples here. Uh, this one, I think, is mine. My space chain does this? No, this one's uh, Fiat Jacks. Fiat Jacks space chain that he recently did on Signet. Oops, probably can't see that. Up there, it's, uh, this is a Signet block explorer. So that phrase right there. Ah, where'd it go? Signet, right there. So we're looking at the Signet block explorer here. And this is Fiat Jacks space chain implementation. Uh, he is using OpReturn over here to embed data about the side chain right there. And if you take a look at the details here, you can see uh, where's the OpReturn? Right here. There's a little OpReturn that deposits, let me zoom in, a little OpReturn that deposits 32 bytes of data, and this is the hash of all the transactions that are happening on his, on his side chain. So pretty simple. You can just put a, you can use OpReturn for this. Uh, and you create a linked list. So this transaction right here sends money uh, into itself. So what address is this? Uh, it's, it sends money into this address right here. This is going to be the starting point, starting point for his space chain. And then if you look at the next transaction, he takes money from this address, 9NHFM, and spends it into itself, 9NHFM. And he has another little op return there, corresponding to the second block of the side chain. And if you do the next one, you can see he's spending money from 9NHFM into 9NHFM, and he puts an op return. It's the third block. It's like you can create a linked list of uh, information about what's happening on the side chain without the need for miners to do anything special. Miners just see, here's a regular Bitcoin transaction, I'm just going to mine it. Uh, so he does that. Mine does the same thing. Uh, this one's an example from MySpace chain. You'll notice mine is performed on the glorious testnet because I like it better than Signet. Um, but mine does the same thing, except mine doesn't have an op return. Mine's got um, witness data. So in mine, if you look at the details, uh, mine has a little hash right here that shows you the data that you're, uh, about the side chain. And if you look at the next transaction, we're just spending straight from this address, which is like QRDO, and the money's going into QRDO. If you look at the next one, it's going from QRDO into QRDO, and I put the uh, I put the witness data right here, or right here. Do you use Taproot? You can use Taproot for this too. I'm I'm using regular SegWit without taproot. But yeah, so you can put data about your side chain in the witness data or in an op return, and all you've got to do is just keep making transactions that spend money right into the same address. Uh, and you've got, you've got the side chain. You've got a linked list of information about side chain blocks. Cool, so that's, that's merge, blind merge mining. Uh, anyone can make this just regular Bitcoin transactions. They just have a, a, either an op return or some extra witness data that tells you about the hash of all the transactions on the side chain. Does that make sense to people, how we're doing this? Yeah. Um, What's up? Uh, like, you can merkelize transactions from like an account model, just the same as UTXO model, right? So like, for, like this, theoretically, if you just wanted to do a blind merge mine with like an Ethereum account model style side chain, mm -hmm. you could do that, right? Yeah. Uh, the question was, uh, can you, instead of using a UTXO model like we do in Bitcoin, can you take a hash of, uh, of all the accounts that have money in them on a side chain? and use an account model like Ethereum has. And you can. Actually, you, uh, Mr. Stork, he implemented that. Uh, Ethside is a, is a side chain that uses merge mining, and um, it, has, it does that. So yeah, you can do it with an account model as well and bring Ethereum over to Bitcoin as a side chain. At this point, we're so blind that we just see the hash of whatever the block Whatever ten minutes of activity. Would be. So we have no idea of actually what's there. It could be the XL account, it could be nothing. So there is a question here. We've got, we've got these blocks that are being created in Bitcoin, or these transactions are being created in Bitcoin. They correspond to blocks that are being built in a side chain. The question for us is, is next, who produces these blocks? Because with Fiat Jaffs, you know, I showed you Fiat Jaff space chain. Is it just Fiat Jaff who's got the keys to that address? Like, you know, he's, he's spending money from one address and sending it into itself, and he's doing it again and again and again. 
can he just run off with that? Like, can he like kill the side chain by just not spending it anymore by burning the key? And what about me? Can I can I do that? Like, who's who's actually producing these blocks? And if it's the same guy, isn't that kind of bad? It's like if I'm the only one who can produce these blocks, if, I, if I'm the only one who has the keys to that address, I could just kill it. I could just not let anyone into my blockchain. Uh, and that might be bad. So there's, we've come up with a couple of solutions to allow anyone to produce these blocks. And one of them is to use this uh, function within Bitcoin called anyone can spend. Uh, ordinarily in Bitcoin, if I create a Bitcoin, if I send money into a Bitcoin address, only the person who has the keys to that address can then spend that money and create the next transaction. Um, but if you use the anyone can spend function, which Bitcoin has, you basically make a Bitcoin address that has no private key. And then, as it says, anyone can spend that money. Uh, and so you can do that with space chains, which is what my model actually does. You deposit money into uh, this QRDO address, and the private, this address has no private key. Anyone can spend the money in there. Uh, and the expectation is that people who are trying to mine on the side chain are going to be the ones to actually do that. We're going to um, spend that money. However, there is a problem with that, which is that Anyone can spend that money. So I've got a little graphic here of a thief who decided there's some sats in that address. It's got no private key. I'm just going to run off with it, right? What's stopping this guy from killing the side chain? Uh, it's not a significant problem for blind merge mining because, uh, first of all, the output in here, if you see, uh, it's only 546 satoshis. It's not like the thief is getting anything by doing that. Um, if the side chain was popular, it would be very expensive to actually do this because uh, the, the sidechain miners are paid by all the people who are contributing fees on this sidechain. And so they are willing to spend quite a bit of money to move this output, maybe like thousands of dollars to move this output. Uh, and if a thief is trying to steal this thing, he's going to have to outbid all of these mi miners who are getting paid thousands of dollars to move this output. Uh, and he's not going to get anything from it except 546 sets. So it's, there's no incentive for a thief to do that. But even if he does, even if a thief does take this, it's not just an anyone can spend address, it's also an anyone can deposit address. So you can just put more money in there and then keep the chain going. Um, so that's how mine works. Mine uses the, uh, the prepaid model and it just allows anyone to run off with the money. And if they do, miners can just add more into it and keep going. Uh, and so far it works. Uh, the, the space chain, my space chain is still going. So, so if anyone can spend, I can basically like fork off your space chain and go steal your money, but then you can just send back to that address and keep yeah, it going. Yeah, just like, okay, you took the 550 cents or whatever that we were using to track this output, we'll just put 50 more cents in and then we'll pick up from wherever we left off. Uh, yeah, so that's how mine works. We just get around anyone can spend by letting anyone spend it if they want to. But there are a couple things. One problem with that is that it can, it can disable your blockchain for like one block. Because you, you expected to create a block there, but someone stole the money and didn't put a block in. Uh, so there's just no sidechain block for one block, and then, then it picks up with the next one. It kind of makes the sidechain a little bit slower if someone does this, uh, because instead of having a one-to-one -one mapping, like every Bitcoin block, there's also a sidechain block. Uh, this makes it so that there's, there's not. There's, there's sometimes you're missing, you're missing one. So it slows it down. What's up? I guess my question is, well, why do you have to have, if you're already creating an address, why do you have to have sets always be deposited in the address? Like, well, you not, are you moving from that address, you said? You, you, yeah, because you make the linked list. This, you spend from this address to itself. You just keep on spending the money into itself, and every time you include a 32-byte uh, a, a value to show that that's, the, that's what's in the site chain. So in order to keep doing that, you've got to have money in the address to spend. Um, so, but yeah, if, if it gets stolen, you can just add more to it. But still, that does slow down the blockchain, or at least it could if someone actually went through the trouble to steal the output. And so we have some proposals to fix that. You have a question? Christian has a question. Yeah, is there like a scenario where a false hash is merge mine? So I was wondering about the drive, drive, drive chain that we managed to ask. Right? Yeah, in drive chains and in space chains. Is it excluded by the security model? like? People, the question was, what if someone puts in a, a fake hash, if they put in a hash that doesn't have a corresponding block, uh, and people who are following the sidechain, then they just skip it. Or an invalid block, right, or something. Mm -hmm. Or what if they put in an invalid block? You, you just skip it. Uh, like, like in Bitcoin, if someone sends you a, a bad block in Bitcoin, you just ignore it, and you ban them. 
Uh, with these, you just ignore invalid blocks and then move on to the next one that is valid. So I think yours works the same way, right? Yeah, I was just going to say that is the heat the mean the uh, line work mind block is equal to meeting the difficulty requirement. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a valid block. So if someone does the they put the invalid block hash in for merge mining, then it will at first it will look it, the block will meet the difficulty requirement, so you check that part. It's just like in regular Bitcoin, you check the difficulty well, okay, it meets the difficulty requirement first the header. But then you check the block and say, well, it's not valid, and then you get rid of it. Yeah, so you, using client-side software, you ignore bad blocks. That's and that's the solution. Right? So we have a couple, since this does potentially slow down the space chain, we have uh, some proposals to fix it. I didn't implement any of these because I don't really care if it's slightly slower than the regular Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin's slow enough as it is, and no one seems to care. So uh, I didn't even fix this, but... Fiat Jeff's space chain that he released a few weeks ago does fix this with a Covenant soft fork. Or you can use BIP300, which is his invention, to fix it. Um, but before I do that, I want to give a little more details on the anyone can spend model. Uh, so the basic idea is you put 546 sats in an anyone can spend address, which I appropriately acronymed the AXA. Uh, then you look, your, your client software, your software that's following the space chain, looks for a linked list of transactions that just they, they just make a cycle. They just pay out from that and back into into the same address. You recreate the AXA output. And every one of those has a little hash in it of what's on the side chain. If there is a theft, if somebody runs off with the money, it's detectable because suddenly your linked list no longer goes back to itself. It's no longer going to the address that's supposed to be in there. Suddenly it's going to the thief's address. Uh, and so that's detectable and then you just start, your, your software then just starts scanning the blockchain where after that theft happens, the first uh, transaction that puts money back into the anyone can spend address is the new Bitcoin that everyone has to use in order to continue the chain. Uh, and so if thefts are detectable, and then you just let anyone get the, get the thing going again, and you might have to spend one, one Bitcoin block without a corresponding sidechain block, but I think that's fine. How do you fix it, though? Well, there's a couple ways to fix it. One of them, this one does not require a soft fork. Uh, there's a prepaid model. So to use the prepaid model, 20 people make a multi-sig and they crowd some, crowdfund some sats to uh, get this multi-sig going. Uh, and they co-sign a linked list of blind merge mining tra transactions. A lot of words here, so let me go back and illustrate it with some graphics. Um, so we've got a Bitcoin address here, and actually, let me go back to this one. Uh, yeah, this one. So we've got a Bitcoin address here, uh, QRDO, and we keep on spending from QRDO into QRDO. Well, here I'm using anyone can spend. The prepaid model says instead of using anyone can spend, let's use a multi-sig. We'll have like 20 trusted people in Bitcoin get together, they'll create a Bitcoin address that 20 people have the keys to, uh, and then they will crowdfund like three Bitcoins, and they will create um, a series of transactions that spend that spend from uh, the initial address back into itself you know, a million times, and each one of those leaves a little space where whoever is going to mine that transaction can insert the hash of whatever's on the side chain. So back to this slide. So that's these guys. They're just like, trust us, bro. We're going to make all of these side chain, or we're going to prepare all of these side chain transactions. Uh, and you just give us enough bitcoins to make this long chain of transactions that are going to uh, be available for people to create sidechain blocks with. Uh, but what they do is they don't publish these transactions. They don't broadcast them. They just sign them, and then they make them available on a website somewhere. And each one, each transaction, somebody takes it, uh, fills in the gap, fills in the missing piece of data where, the, where there's a hash of the sidechain block, and then once it's completed, once the template's completed, they publish that transaction. So now you can recreate that linked list uh, using this, uh, this multi-sig address that these guys have the keys to. And the only way that it stops working is if these guys run off with the money. Uh, so you just loop forever until they steal it. And if, as long as one of these guys is honest and do doesn't co-sign to steal the money, then it never stops. It, you can just keep doing that forever. Uh, I don't like this model because I hate people, 
Uh, I'm kidding. I love people, but I don't trust them. I don't trust faceless black guys. They're, I mean, I, I meant, that's not what I meant. I meant this guy. I don't. Silhouettes. I don't trust silhouettes. Whew. Cancel. So, I don't like this model, but you can do this. And uh, uh, Ruben Thompson was working on a model that used the prepaid construction. Uh, to make a space chain. Uh, Fiat Jack used covenants because on Signet, which is the one he made, uh, we have covenants. We have any prev out and we have CTV. Covenant, of course, heard of them at the other talks here. It's a soft fork that if, if we get them into Bitcoin, they let you specify outputs in your locking script. You, you basically create a whitelist. You say, I'm going to put some Bitcoins in this address, and this address can only send money to this, to this whitelisted set of addresses. That's what covenants do, they create whitelists. Uh, and if you use them, and you could just make the only address that the address can send money to be itself. And then no one can run off with the money, because they have to put it right back into itself. So covenants let us avoid the problem where anyone can run off with the money, uh, but the spender of the money must, he just has to create the, he has to put the money back into the same address and add the hash, and that's all it can do. Uh, so that's what covenants let us do, and we have them on Signet, so that's where Space, uh, Fiat Jack made his space chain. Uh, so let's talk about use cases now. Uh, the first use case is to kill all altcoins. Uh, altcoins are super flimsy projects that can be killed by the faintest little thing. Uh, I think even if we just use burning bitcoins as the model of getting bitcoins onto a space chain, we can still kill altcoins with that because they're completely... In, the altcoins have no need to exist at all. Uh, but basically, anything you can do on an altcoin, like let's say you have like Ethereum or something, you can just copy its code base, put it on Bitcoin, make a space chain out of it, uh, and then you can even use the burning Bitcoins method to get Bitcoins onto that space chain, and that'll still allow you to like pay for fees and stuff uh, on the side chain and create blocks and things, but you don't need an altcoin anymore. You just use Bitcoin or use even dead Bitcoins that used to exist, uh, and as long as miners are willing to accept them, it'll still work. So space chains allow us to kill all altcoins by making copies of them as Bitcoin side chains. Uh, you can also use them for domain name records, which is like we could rebuild Namecoin, but as a space chain. The one that Fiat Jeff made is a stablecoin and NFT space chain, which makes me vomit because I hate those things. Uh, you could also play with two-way pegs. Like maybe you want to um, you want to use Liquid, but you don't trust the uh, faceless black men who run it, so the silhouettes who run it. So you make your own. What if you make your own liquid? And you're one of these guys, and you trust yourself, so you made your own liquid, now you're just running that. You can make liquid into a space chain. Um, so you can play with two-way pegs, you can maybe come up with some new two-way peg model that uh, no one else has come up with. That's an option. The space chains let us do all of these things. And so yes, so you can do with them. Any questions about what you can do with space chains? Is Axe a space chain, and could you build space chains on Noster? Yes and yes. So I mentioned earlier that I implemented the first space chain and Fiat Jeff implemented the second. Technically, Stacks implemented the first space chain. Because if you look at the technical requirements to be one, Stacks, uh, we're back here. Stacks does do blind merge mining. They do take a hash of each of their blocks. Anyone can mine them and put them into Bitcoin. And they did, at least initially, they had a one way price peg where you did the proof of burn thing to burn Bitcoins and put them on there. So Stacks is actually the first space chain. But they're really, Stacks is like the worst thing in the world um, because they also created an altcoin that they pre-mined and gave to themselves and now they use that. So like, you can do wicked things with space chains, don't be like Stacks. But technically they were first. They, they invented this before Ruben did. Uh, and they, did, they implemented it before I did, and before Fiat Jack did. So why not just do them on Noster? Uh, can you do them on Noster? You can use Noster as a transport layer for sharing block data, but uh, one thing that I have found to be a problem with Noster is that uh, relays go down and you lose the data that are on them. So if you don't have that data stored redundantly, you could lose your blockchain, which would be bad. So. Instead of doing maybe a little more complicated plot, but couldn't you do like a uh, taproot and do a threshold Schnorr signature? So instead of doing multi sig and just have better privacy. Yeah. So the question was, could you use a multi-sig, uh, or sorry, a music uh, threshold signature with Schnorr to create a federation uh, and run a space chain that way? Yes, you, excuse me, you can. 
It's the same security model as a multi-sig, though. It's just a different technique for doing multi-sigs. Right. Better privacy. Better and it has better privacy. Go for did you have a question? Uh, I just want to point out, I, I think there's a project out there, uh, somebody did do something like a space chain in Oscar. They turned it into a state machine, too. It's kind of a crazy project. I'm trying to look it up now. Topher uh, said that there is, someone did make a space chain on Oscar or something like one, and uh, he's looking up the name of it. So get back to me. I've, I've not heard of this project. Okay, two part question. So, like, when the two way thing, I guess the definition is that that means it's like an atomic, it's an atomic where you can like um, exchange it atomically versus having like have like wooden gliders. Uh, the question is, uh, are two way pegs atomic? Yeah. It depends. Usually, no. Usually they're not. Uh, like the the, the, the two-way pegs we have today are federated, uh, federated two-way pegs, where there's a multi-sig that you deposit the money to, and then they promise to give it back to you when you're done with the side chain. Uh, and it it seems to work pretty well. Like I don't I I haven't met anyone who complained that they gave money to Liquid and then they didn't give it back. Um, but there was a recent case where Oasis is a, a Ethereum side chain, and that actually did happen to someone. Uh, there was, a, there was a thief who stole some money on the Oasis sidechain of Ethereum, which uses a multi-sig to hold, hold the money, just like Liquid. Uh, and they got a court order to freeze the funds of the thief. Uh, and so that thief can't get his money out. So that's the only case I'm aware of where a sidechain is actually, or where a federated multi-sig is actually like failed, where it wouldn't give someone their money uh, due to a court order. But uh, except for that case, they seem pretty reliable. Like, Everyone's get, getting their money out of liquid just fine and root, root stock just fine, so they kind of work. It's definitely not atomic. The multi sig can freeze your assets if they want to. All right, what's up? Uh, for the anyone can spend, mm -hmm. so there's the somebody tries to burn it and who cares because you keep on going the next block. Yeah. But what if they spent it to a different like hash? Uh, like, so they kept on spending it, but it was a. Uh, uh, block hash for the space chain that was basically invalid. Would that like confuse clients? Um, no, but so the question is, what if the thief in this in this model took the money, um, it, it created a, put it back into the same address again, but included an invalid hash of a uh, space block that doesn't exist? Uh, if that happened, it would be treated by client software the same way Bitcoin treats invalid blocks. Uh, so when when someone gives you an invalid block header in Bitcoin. Um, you request the full block and you examine it for validity, and if it's invalid, you just ignore it and you ban that peer. Uh, and that's the same thing that would happen in this case. If someone, if a thief took the money, put it back into the address, included an invalid space block hash, you would request the block, you'd examine its transactions, and find it's invalid in that, or he wouldn't even give you anything, and then you'd just ignore that, ignore that uh, hash and move on to the next one. How are, how are like rewards handled in that, right? So there's not just a bad block, but maybe competing blocks, right? So I guess you have one space chain hash and one block and another that's pointing to two blocks prior, and they have to like to like reconcile it some way, right? Uh, it's you just go with. So the question was, what happens if there's a reorg in Bitcoin, or if that happens and you have two yeah, different reorg in the space chain? So you you presumably have people that are like competing to get their their version of the space chain into the Bitcoin block, right? Yeah, there, you can have two people competing to get the same, uh, to occupy the same slot of Bitcoin, but only one of them can actually get in, uh, because, uh, and, and so whichever one gets in, on that, yeah. is you just go with whichever one comes first, unless it's invalid. Uh, next, I wanted to compare this with two-way pegs. So we have a couple, of, we have federated two-way pegs. Actually, I started to do this in answer to your question. Federated sidechains work today. Uh, they're a blockchain run by uh, a Silhouettes, uh, and they create an M of N multi-sig, and they ask you for your money, and they, we have those today. Liquid and Rootstock work pretty well. What's good about them, in my opinion, is that you don't need a soft fork to do them, and, and they work. <laughs> People get into these things and they don't lose their money, which is, which is good, um, unless you're the Oasis thief. Uh, to add money to a federated space chain, you just send it to the to the faceless silhouettes, and then they issue you the same amount on the side chain. Or usually that happens automatically. Um, and then to take money off, you just say, "Okay, I'm done using the space side chain now. Give me my money back." And that works. Like no software is needed to do this, and, and people use them. Uh, well, not really. It's like two people who use them, but they work. So I like I like federated side chains. But in comparison with these. Um, Space chains are a bit better because there's none of this part. 
There's, there's no faceless group of people running this who you have to trust, unless you use the prepaid model, um, which is good. That, that, it, it's more trustless, or they're more close to trustless. Um, comparing them with another two-way peg model, this gentleman invented drive chains, which is a type of blockchain where you, like with, side, like with space chains, you take a hash of each block and you put the hash in a Bitcoin block, uh, and then to add money to a drive chain, you send it to a Bitcoin address controlled by 51% of miners, which is a really complicated thing that he can explain. Well, actually, it's super simple, but he can explain it in his talk that he did earlier, so go watch that. Uh, and then to take money off a drive chain, you ask them to send it to you, and you prove that you are supposed to be allowed this money according to the rules of the side chain. Uh, this model, the one he came up with, requires two soft forks, BIP301 and BIP300. Uh, and so in comparison with that, the benefit of space chain is that it doesn't require a soft fork. It, it's, it's like the first one. You can do them today without needing a soft fork. Uh, however, we, what, what the bad part is we don't have a solution for getting money onto the space chain. All we have is destroy your bitcoins, which isn't a really good solution. So uh, yeah, we're still coming up with stuff for that. Uh, and then the last thing I want to compare them to is roll-ups. A roll-up is similar, it's actually quite similar to a drive chain in my opinion, but instead of making a hash of each block, you make a zero knowledge proof of all of its contents, and you put that little proof in Bitcoin. It's usually like a small file, I think it's like 64 kilobytes. Um, but then to add money to a roll-up, you send it to a Bitcoin address guarded by this new opcode that hasn't even been written yet. Uh, and to withdraw from it, you just pr you supply a proof that according to the rules of the sidechain, you're allowed to withdraw that money. And then Bitcoin nodes would pass it through this function and let you withdraw the money. Um, but this requires you know, a software to add this to Bitcoin and no one's even written this yet. So who knows what that'll look like when it comes out. So the benefit of space chain in comparison, no software needed. We don't, we don't have this part in there, uh, but downside, they have a way of, they have a theory, theoretical way to add money to a space a side chain and get it off again, and we don't. So, those are some comparisons with three popular models of doing side chains. Uh, these are my references if you want to check out any of this, uh, any of this stuff. I also want to uh, zoom in on this part. Um, this presentation is available from a bit.ly link right there. So, get out your smartphones and snap it if you want to visit any of these links uh, and then check out the resources. But the last thing I want to do is demo my space chain and uh, PHS. So I will give you 30 seconds. I will, I will wait till I don't see anyone's phones out, and then I will, and then I will move on to the next thing uh, where we're going to demo a space chain. All right, everybody, good? Great. So now everyone should be on this page. Everyone who brought a laptop and wants to do it, you can be on this page, and we're going to make a space chain together. Uh, ready? Let's do it. What are we going to call our space chain? Outer space. <laughs> Outer space. You can optionally include a genesis message, just like Bitcoin had one. What do we want our genesis message to be, guys? Long live testnet. Long live testnet. Long live so <laughs> Who wants to bet that's how you spell it? <laughs> that like sweets. The H goes long. Oh, I <laughs> Okay, so there's this whole paragraph that says read before clicking, uh, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alright, so here's our, here's our first space block. We're going to anchor this into Bitcoin by taking a hash of it and putting that hash in the witness data of the transaction. Here's the Bitcoin address we need to send to. We need to send 846 sets to that address. I'm going to go to a testnet faucet. And put this in here, say 0 0.0846, and send. Okay, and now this page should detect that within about 30 seconds. And what we're going to see is it's going to redirect us to a page where we can view our space chain and mine it. Uh, and I'm going to share the link with you all so that if you guys want to mine blocks on top of this side chain we just created, you can mine it. Like anyone can mine these things because anyone can spend this money. Um, so it'll be it'll be a lot of fun. But uh, gotta gotta get that gotta get that gotta get that space chain mine. <laughs> there we go. Success. Your space block is anchored in this Bitcoin transaction. 
we hit OK, and it redirects us to a place where we can behold our little network. I'm going, if anyone wants to mine on this, you can register as a miner and mine the next block in this thing. So let me give you all the link. Bitly. Uh, refresh, scroll down, paste. If anyone wants to copy this, get out your smartphones and uh, go to this URL if you want to be a miner. But yeah, we've created a space chain. It was super easy. Like, have you ever created a blockchain that easily, guys? Come on, that deserves an applause. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you want to create your own side chain, it is as easy as like forking this code and changing the rules, the rules of the side chain. It's super easy to make your own side chain now because space chains are this really clever, cool way to do it without the software. Uh, everyone got this? Cool. So anyone can go mine that if you want to. And let's just take a look at it. So it has one block, which is right here. This is the Bitcoin transaction that it's anchored in. Uh, it's not yet confirmed, so it, it could be double spent and someone else could put, put a different block in there. It's got some information about it. There's only one transaction, which is the one that creates the space chain's name and message. And uh, if you want to go mine it, you can just register as a miner. You're at block height one. You can add new blocks to it. What do we want as our next transaction in this thing? What? Phil is a moron. There we go. Add that to the block. What do you, what do you want our next transaction to say? No, you just said no. <laughs> Let's mind this. Someone told me, oh, we can't. We have to wait until the previous block gets confirmed before we can make a new one. Oh, man, that sucks. Someone told me the other day that this part's broken and that he went to mine it and it said something went wrong and then just refreshed the page. So um, the code might be broken here. But this is this is my space chain implementation. It's written in JavaScript. And if you want to fork it and make your own side chain, this is probably the easiest way to do it. Uh, but also, we have another space chain made, because Fiat Jeff made one, and I'm going to show it to you. But first I have to delete my copy of it. Uh, RMRF, so on. I gotta do C2. C2. There we go. So now I don't have Soma, and we're gonna go see how to do Fiat Jeffs. So if you wanna do this one, you go to github.com slash, well, actually, you go to my, this, and you click here. And that's how you get to Fiat implementation of a space chain. Uh, so his is called SOMA, Space Chain Inspired Open Market for Assets. This is designed for NFTs and stablecoins. And uh, it does one neat thing about his is that you don't burn Bitcoins on his. He uses the Lightning Network to pay for to pay to mine transactions, which is kind of cool because he came up with a solution. He just designed a blockchain where you don't need Bitcoins because all you're doing is issuing NFTs. Uh, and then you just pay miners with lightning to mine your transaction that creates this NFT. So let's do, uh, download this thing. Git clone. Git clone. Paste. And now we've got, well, we'll have a copy of it in a few seconds. Uh, and then he gives instructions down here uh, with a little tutorial. So we are going to follow these instructions. It's my to run this. Once we have, once the thing is downloaded, we just need to run this and we will have, uh, we'll be in a space chain. Go into Soma, paste this line, and oh, I need to do it with sudo in my case. Okay, and boom. This is Fiat Jack's space chain. His is a little different from mine because it has less of a graphical user interface. Um, but it is currently cycling through Bitcoin and finding all of the blocks in his. This is also global. Uh, he does have a nice visual uh, explorer for his. If we, cut, we can actually take a look at it. Come on. How come I can't copy that? Oh. 0 .0 .0 .0 0. 0.0.0.0.0. So this is the graphical version of his explorer. It's still synchronizing, so there are no, uh, there's no blocks in this block explorer yet. But it's got a couple of cool features in it. Uh, it. It is a global one, unlike the one I made, where uh, anyone can mine it, but it, it's like everyone makes their own space chain. On his, everyone shares one. 
Uh, it is currently synchronizing all of these blocks on Signet, and once it gets to the tip, we'll be able to view all the blocks it's found in the Block Explorer. Um, he also has support for the Lightning Network, so you can actually use uh, Core Lightning to do some stuff in his. And uh, as soon as it's synchronized, I will show you all of that. Um, but one difference between his and mine uh, is that mine burns Bitcoins and his doesn't. Second difference between his and mine, his requires a soft fork and mine doesn't. So they're kind of neat, like two different space chains, one of them needs a soft fork, and yeah, look at all this data. Uh, are we close to getting ready to do this thing yet? Uh, if, you're not, if you're not burning the Bitcoin, are you just trusting, like, how do you, because the burning the Bitcoin is kind of how you validate, like, new value going on to the side chain, right? The question was, uh, how do you validate that new value has entered the side chain uh, like, listen, if you don't the, burn I Bitcoin? Take, I take the edge app in over lightning, and then I'm going to get some side chain coin. You don't. Yeah. So, the question was, uh, how do I, he started a question, which started out, if I give Fiat Jeff Bitcoin over Lightning, and then he's supposed to give me some sidechain coins, space chain coins, space coins, then I cut him off and said, you don't get space coins. Yeah, on his, all you're doing is you're, you create a piece of text that issues an asset. Like, it might be an inscription, or it might be a, um, uh, what's it called, uh, a, a stable coin. You create this piece of text, and you say, hey, Fiat Jeff, put this in the next space block for me. And then Faya Jeff looks at that and says, okay, I'm gonna charge you 500 sats to do that. And you pay him over lightning, and when you pay him, he puts that text on the space chain. So th there is no burning of Bitcoins involved there. It's just, it's just adding text to a blockchain. With no, there's no value to it unless you start selling that JPEG for money. So, so unless you start selling that JPEG for money, so then, then his side chain could then transfer that asset between different users. On the yeah, so then he said, and then you can transfer it. Yeah, you can on, once you have once it's mine and it's in your you know space chain address, you can then transfer it to other people's space chain addresses, presumably in exchange for Bitcoin. Uh, so <laughs> let's see if it's done yet. So so I guess no. Nope. Does a burning actually happen then? On his it doesn't. On on Fiat Jeff's there is no burning. Uh, on mine. Well, I didn't go into it because, let's see if we can, maybe we can mine this now. Yeah, we can mine it now, sweet. So let's, uh, let's mine this, copy that, and I will show you where you burn Bitcoins in mine. Is there a way to not burn Bitcoins on space chains? Yeah, you do one like Fiat Jeff did. His doesn't burn Bitcoins. Yeah, but his requires a software, right? Yes. So there's no hacking needed? Is anybody carrying without a software? Well, you could you could make you could copy mine, uh, and then replace the part that burns bitcoins with his thing that does it over lightning, uh, and then replace the thing on mine that lets you transfer sidechain coins and only transfer like NFTs and stable coins. What's the highest amount that you can burn? On twenty-one million bitcoins. bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the question was. I mean, I guess I should reward it. What's the least amount that you can burn to start a space chain on yours? Uh, 846 sats. Uh, the question was, what's the least amount you can burn to create a space chain on mine? And it would be just uh, an, uh, a, uh, a dust output. So success, your space block is mined and anchored in this transaction. Yeah, I don't know what the guy was saying. He said this part's broken. Maybe it just didn't work on his machine. But it works on my machine. So if we view our space chain now, we've got two blocks. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, they're just stored in local storage on here. Uh, and if, if someone else comes on and uh, requests them from me, uh, if someone else comes on and, and uses the same space chain, their um, their machine will connect to my machine and request the blocks. Then if some the third person comes on, he'll request it from both of us, and we just share blocks with each other. That's yeah, but also this is only storing it in local storage. So if I show you my console here. Uh, local storage. Your space chain is like this thing, and uh, local storage can only hold like five megabytes of data. So you can't. I mean, this, these space chains are just proof of concept. You can only you can only have like maybe three hundred blocks or something, and then they'll just die due to lack of storage space. So, but yeah, as a proof of concept, this is a, this is I think is pretty cool. Uh, let's see if Fiat Jeffs is done yet. No, Fiat Jeffs is still. My goodness. 
I don't see so when I originally did this with his, it took like minutes. It, it, it synced in minutes, and now it's taking it, it like started in 2020. Well, anyway, we might not get to see Fiat Jacks, so I'm sorry. But yeah, we made a space chain together, guys. I think that's the end of the presentation. Great, we have to wrap it. <laughs> have fun everybody. Thank you for coming. <laughs>